Good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Dalglish, Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, which is the host of the Shirley Povich Center for Sports Journalism. Thank you all for coming out on this horribly cold evening. Um, it, I know it, it took some resilience, so thank you very much. Philip Merrill College is proud to be the home of the Povich Center. And for at least eight years, the Povich Center at Knight Hall has hosted relevant and thought-provoking discussions about important issues at the intersection of sports, society, and the media. The generosity of the Povich family and the leadership of the amazing Povich Center team, George Solomon, Kevin Blackestone, and Caitlin Wilson, helped make the Povich Center one of the country's finest sports journalism programs. Actually, not one of, it's the best. The symposium was created in honor of Shirley Povich, formerly of the Washington Post, as a platform for students to learn the importance of storytelling, strong writing, and the intersection of sports and culture. Thank you to the Povich family for everything they have done to support the center. David, Lynn, and Maury Povich have created an absolutely fitting tribute to their legendary father and Merrill College is grateful to be the home of Shirley Povich's legacy. For those of you who have not heard, George Solomon is retiring in June of 2020, and this is the last symposium he's had to organize. In the future, he'll just be able to enjoy himself. So once again, we are grateful to the Povich family for their leadership in helping us create the new George Solomon Chair in Sports Journalism. That's good. Those of you who understand academic life understand that endowed chairs help colleges sustain programs and curriculum and help attract quality faculty members. And George leaving will create very big shoes to fill. The Povich family is giving Merrill College $1 million, which has been matched by $500,000 from the university. We must raise the remaining $500,000 for the $2 million chair. The chair is critical to our sustaining the Povich Center operations for years to come so that we can continue educating aspiring sports journalists who learn how to cover not just the game action, but the business and analytics of the sport. It will also help us provide public programming like we have tonight. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was visiting one of the three major sports leagues, and of course, I'm the dean, I was asking for money. And they um, started talking about how difficult it was for professional athletes to be peppered with critiques and falsities by irresponsible, falsehood-telling bloggers and other people on the internet, and how damaging it can be to professional athletes and their families. That's not what students here are learning. Our students um, learn to cover stories truthfully, legally, ethically, and thoroughly. And we need your support. So to that end, please save the date of April 1st, 2020, for George's retirement party, or as we're calling it at Merrill College, Georgia Palooza. We are putting together the host committee and have sponsorship opportunities available for the big party here at the Riggs Alumni Center. If you're interested in joining, please let me or Katie Owney, my assistant dean, know. And more information and her contact information is in the program. So thanks to all of the students in the audience in particular, enjoy the discussion. This year's symposium is held in collaboration with the new Howard Center for Sports, or I'm sorry, Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. And we're looking forward to partnering on future events and investigative reporting projects. So now I would like to introduce the director of the Shirley Povich Center for Sports Journalism, George Solomon. Thank you, Dean. Um, I certainly didn't think a chair could cost as much, especially when my wife is not buying it. So, uh, actually, uh, actually, it's a ridiculous amount, and I haven't yet told my wife that uh, we're transferring uh, my Washington Post 401 account into the chair account. 
<laughs> so, you know, sleep on that for a while. Uh, to be honest with you, the uh, Povich Symposium started in, get this, 2003, the first three years uh, at the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Jewish Community Center. We moved out to Maryland in 2006 and have had the symposium every year uh, since with Maury Povich as the moderator. Uh, Emilio, you have big shoes to fill, but only in, his, in, in this case, your show, not Maury's show. And, um, but uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to start the program by introducing uh, Emilio Garcia Ruiz, our moderator, who's a graduate of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism in 1983, where he was uh, the Diamondback Managing Editor. Uh, he also went to Gonzaga High School, now uh, the, actually the number one professional football team in Washington, D.C. <laughs> That would be funny if it wasn't so true. Uh, 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 Emilio, after he graduated from uh, Merrill, uh, did uh, four years at the Prince George's Journal, and then he was night sports editor, one of my uh, good hires from 1987 to 1990. I drove him out to the Orange County Register uh, and then to the LA Times. In St. Paul, where he was sports editor of the Pioneer Press, he won a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, for that, we're grateful that he's here. He was uh, at the Washington Post as my assistant from 2001 to 2003, became the sports editor and a job he held from 2003 to 2009, was the local editor at the Washington Post from 2009 to 2011. And I'm proud to say Emilio is the managing editor of the Washington Post, one of four, and, uh, but he's in charge of the digital operation of which I don't know, I still know how to turn on a computer, but that's Emilio's job now, not mine. So without further ado, Emilio, uh, introduce the panel, and good luck. Thank you, George. I would apologize for all of us to Hazel, but at this point, after being married to George as long as she has insults like that, mm -hmm. I think are pretty much par for Hazel's course. I'm not going to introduce the panelists. I hate doing that. It takes a ton of time. We're just going to get right into it, and we'll introduce as we, um, as we uh, start speaking. Uh, the year was uh, 776 B.C. Uh, for the students in the room, that is pre-Netflix. Uh, there was a fellow named Pelops, and Pelops was in a really important charity, a chariot race against uh, King Oinomos. And King Oinomos was favored in the race, so what Pelops did is he basically paid the king's charioteer to throw the race, crash the chariot, and he won. Uh, with his winnings, he started the Olympic Games. So as we do a panel on uh, corruption and problems in sports, uh, we begin with the uh, belief that this has been around forever. Uh, what has changed, though, is the severity of the problems, uh, and they have gone beyond simple trying to get a leg up in competition by knocking off another person's chariot to, cri to crimes, misdemeanors, and things that go into all sort of areas of society. With those changes, there's been a big change in journalism, and that's really what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, how journalism has adapted to cover some of these stories. Uh, it is very easy to read a sports page now and believe that sports is basically one large dumpster fire where every athlete is in trouble in one way or another. But Bob Lee, uh, long time of ESPN, that is not the case. But how did we get here? How, how is it that we are standing here 3,000 years later uh, talking about these sorts of problems in sports? And chariots, no less. Um, there is a mythology, though, no pun intended off your opening story, about sports that we want to embrace as kids. We all have our memories. These games matter to us. We all can remember. I can remember the first baseball game my dad took me to in 1961. These, these recollections, these memories have value to us. It's part of the culture. Uh, but things have just grown and metastasized. I, I, recently, ESPN observed its 40th anniversary, and the question was, well, what's changed? Well, 40 years ago, there were sports, and there were leagues, and there were teams, and there were newspapers. Unfortunately, not as many of them. 
But now what we have is a sports entertainment industry that worldwide, the one number put to it, I think is $650 billion a year, kind of number that I guess only Elizabeth Warren can quantify at some point. Mm -hmm. But you know, sports has become a cultural force. It's become a commercial force. It's become a political force. And with that power and that money at stake, things happen, bleep happens. But there's still that poetry. We want to believe that baseball is handed down generation to generation, yet at the same time, the most cherished part of the game, the numbers, of course, run afoul and into steroids, and, and those numbers are just befouled by corruption. We want to believe that there are values that football can impart, and indeed there are, but at the same time, there's the National Football League rushing to make a settlement, a class action settlement, to foreclose any discovery in discussion. And there is Mark and his brother's book, uh, League of Denial being waved around at a court hearing earlier this year as insurance companies battle with the National Football League. We want to believe the grace and the power of gymnastics will showcase these remarkable young women. And then we learned about the story of Larry Nasser, that horror, and we learned about the enabling and all the responsibility for many people that, that have to live with the legacy of that horrible tragedy. Um, investigative journalism makes a difference in, in looking into all of this. But there is that constant cat and mouse game between the white hats and the dark hats. Uh, very quickly, I'll wrap up with a little anecdote. It's from the Oscar-winning documentary, Icarus. I don't know if anyone's seen that. It's on Netflix. It's available uh, now that we're in the Netflix era. And uh, it's the story of Brian Fogel, the director and producer. And you can watch in real time as he develops the story of exposing Russia's state-sponsored doping through his cooperation and his cultivation of Gregory Radchenko, a scientist. You watch it happening in real time. This is serious business. This is the political side. This is a national policy. There are two unexplained deaths of Russian scientists in this entire drama. And basically, Fogel uh, gathers all this information, Radchenko in fear of his life. They've got spreadsheets. They've got documentation. They were, with Russian state government assistance, cutting holes through the wall of the labs at the Sochi Olympics to exchange urine samples, prying open dirty urine samples, exchanging for clean. They showed with documentation that there was no, since the disaster of the Russian poor showing in 2010, there was no clean Russian Olympic effort. So Fogel leverages all this information that he tells WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency that he has, in one of the most remarkable scenes in real time you'll ever see in journalism. He's able to bring his cameras into a meeting around a table, not much larger than this. Fogel's there, he's got his laptop and one of his producers, he's got two or three cameras in the room and he's got the head of the WADA uh, testing organization. He's got a member of the International Olympic Committee. He's got athletes who are on the IOC. Got all the white hats who figure they've got their arms around this problem. That they, yeah, it's a cat and mouse game, but we're on the edge. We've got Olympic testing and we know what's wrong. And, then Fogel starts to play the interviews, and then he shows them the spreadsheets, and then he basically shows them there has never been any real anti-doping effort by the, one of the most powerful nations on Earth in the last decade. And you could watch in real time this remarkable scene. It's about 90 minutes into the movie, I highly recommend it. The looks on the faces of these people who thought they had their arm around this problem, that they could explain it, that they could taint it. And it was anguish, it was anger, it was disbelief, everyone with a different reaction. So even when, with the highest scientific acuity and ability to detect, we've got it, no, you don't have it covered. And watch that and you'll understand the, I think, futility of trying to think you'll ever stomp this out. So there's a microphone up front. We welcome people's questions. Some of these stories we're gonna talk about are pretty complicated, but if you have any questions or any any observations, please jump in. So David, should we just, you know, you worked at Turner Sports, ESPN, at the Post for a long time, mm -hmm. now you're editor, sports editor of The <coughs> Athletic. Should we just give up and just watch This Is Us all the time and <laughs> stop watching sports? Mm -hmm. What do we, what, what, what do you think? No, because to Bob's point, the, um, the seductive nature of sports is that it is a meritocracy. We want to believe that if somebody is faster than someone else or stronger than someone else or more talented than someone else, that that talent will show itself over the course of a given period of time. It is a seduction. It is not necessarily true, but we want to believe it. We like our myths. Our myths are very powerful, especially in this country. Our myths are extremely powerful. And so we 
there is value in seeking out the truth with regard to what's going on in various sports, whether it's Balco or whether it's uh, the old NASCAR adage, if you're not cheating, you're not trying, and all the various things that are done in motorsports, all the various things that are done in Olympic sports, basically in all sports, um, that give anyone any type of competitive advantage, they're going to seek it. It is our job to try and find out how they seek it and try to point out when they seek it. Uh, it is up to you to decide if that's important enough to you to stop watching or to stop caring about the sports. It is not, it's not up to the media to decide. It's up to consumers to decide whether you can live with mendacity and whether you can live with cheating as a way of life because it is a way of life in most sports. Um, whether you want to believe that <clears throat> out of the goodness of his heart, Penny Hardaway gave a million dollars to Memphis and just happened to move the best basketball player in the country's family to Memphis last year just because he's altruistic. You can believe that. It's okay. <clears throat> it's a, no, I'm serious. You, can, you are allowed to believe that. You're allowed to believe that. Um, and you're allowed to cheer for Memphis. Um, and if, it's not, if they're not found to have broken any rules, we'll see. But I, I, I kind of doubt that most big-time athletics, whether it's college or pro, uh, nobody's innocent, <laughs> and uh, it is, again, it's up to you. It's not, it, it's not up to the people that tell you what's happening. It's up to you to decide whether or not that's worth you investing more of your time and money. So Mark Fainro Wada, uh, now of ESPN, when he was with the San Francisco Chronicle, and his partner Lance Williams sort of tore apart the Balco case and, and really talk about a, a fantasy, the home run uh, race between Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds was mythical, uh, and it was up to Mark and uh, and his partner to sort of tear that down to its studs and and uncover uh, what was really behind that. Uh, fast forward, what's it now? Twenty years later, my goodness, twenty <laughs> years later, ten years later, uh, and now you're you're doing a, a steroid, or you're doing a concussions in the NFL and covering that. So, what is your view of? Of, as an investigative reporter of where sports and society is right now? Well, I, I, I want to, I guess, take issue with something that you said initially, just as a sort of premise around the conversation. I, I, don't, I don't buy this notion that, like, if you pick up the paper most of, or nobody's really picking up the paper, but whatever you're <laughs> picking up to read is, is, is finding that most of the stories they're seeing are this level of corruption that you described. In fact, the reality is, for those of you who are watching our network, 99% of what you watch is trade discussions, it's games, it's mm -hmm. games, it's a lot of games. <laughs> uh, it's people sort of offering their opinions. Some of them are screaming their opinions. <laughs> Others are offering it more gently. But it's a lot of opinions, and it's a lot of games, and it's a lot of trades. And that's true of every, I, I, you know, I live in the Bay Area. I read the San Francisco Chronicle every day, and the sports section is predominantly either positive stories or stories about games. So I, I, I think this, this idea that, like, when there's a group of us up here or wherever who are sort of revealing these hard truths that nobody wants to believe is a, is a sort of pervasive piece of reality. I think that's wrong. So that, that I think is a premise to begin with, but I, I think that the, the, evol the, I don't know that there's been an evolution in it. I just think that the, the appetite is there. I think the appetite has always been there for these stories. It just, it just varies, I think, depending on where you are in the country. I mean, Lance, my colleague used to joke when we were covering the steroid story in the Bay Area, that we would get a lot of grief from people the closer they were to home plate at Candlestick Park mm. or at then AT&T Ballpark. But the further away you got, people were really interested and they wanted to know the truth. And I, I think that's true as stories sort of emerge. The problem is that there's fewer and fewer places that have the resources to do the kind of work that any of us are doing at the table. It's really expensive work. It takes incredible amounts of time mm -hmm. to, to, to do these kinds of stories. I mean, um, you know, Marissa spent endless amounts of time dealing with the Nasser story and, and, um, and Joe looking at, at horse racing and Sasha at, at Aaron Hernandez and all of these stories, they, they take a lot of time and money. And I think that's the difference now is there aren't, you know, there aren't the, the sort of number of venues to produce this kind of work. And I, I happen to be lucky to be at a place that while we have all sorts of issues and conflicts around who we do business with, we have a lot of money to do it. So Sasha, who did a amazing work on Aaron Hernandez. You see uh, a different, as not being a, a full-time sports writer and having done great investigative work 
uh, in your career on, on other subjects. How do you see, for some of the students in the room, sort of the role of, of uh, traditional journalist and sports writer sort of melding together? I mean, I'm sure a lot of the students know that there's this constant debate in the journalism world about whether an investigative reporter is any different than any other kind of reporter. And I think that ideally, even if you're a beat reporter, you want to also be thinking of yourself as an investigative mm -hmm. reporter. The challenge is that you have pressures on you to be producing stories possibly every day, maybe more than once a day, and it can be hard to find the time to do longer projects. But I think that's the best way to approach a beat. And, and any beat, I think, can become an investigative beat, including sports. When you think about the way that sports overlaps with health, with education, with culture, with money, with business. I mean, the potential is enormous, and I think everyone at this table has an example of how they found a great sports story that intersected with some other industry. So I think that um, the potential is huge. Also, in my work life, I've gone back and forth between newspapers and radio, and one of the things I think is uh, interesting about radio is that it has limitations in terms of sometimes not allowing the same depth and detail as print reporting, but it has advantages. Um, for example, when we did our Aaron Hernandez story, we had submitted uh, public information requests for Aaron Hernandez's jail calls. He was at three different jails awaiting trial and after he was convicted. Two of the jails turned us down. One gave them th us 300 phone calls made over six months while Aaron was awaiting trial. We listened to 300 phone calls of about 30 minutes apiece, divided among. You know, it ranged from talking with a sports agent, uh, these very kind of mundane calls, fighting with his girlfriend, really tender calls with his toddler child, intimate, poignant calls where you felt a little voyeuristic listening. But it was this incredible thing that we couldn't have used the full potential of in print, but we could use the full potential of in radio. Uh, Believed is a podcast. Was it Michigan Public Radio that did Believed? I remember when the Larry Nassar story came out, even, I, I had covered clergy sex abuse at the Boston Globe. So even having covered that issue, I was puzzled by how Larry Nassar could have supposedly sexually molested so many young women so apparently with their parents present in some of the rooms. Well, then the New York Times came out with this really incredible story in which Larry Nasser, you know, had his, for example, intravaginal adjustment technique, and all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, this is, might have been what was happening in the room in front of the parent. Well, Believed was able to get the audio of the police interviews of Larry Nasser. And in it, Larry Nasser basically says, oh, they just, they really didn't understand. It was a real misunderstanding. This is a technique I developed that would help readjust the pelvis. And they let him go. But I think that's an example of how if you think about the power of your medium, they could use audio in a way that print couldn't have used. So I also mm -hmm. think there's potential for people, whether thinking about print or broadcast, of what you can do in, your, in what you're covering with the, with the, um, the power of your medium. Yeah, Marissa, why don't you just tell us about your reporting on, on that case? It's amazing. So um, the reporting actually came out of, you know, in talking about intersections with other things, the reporting actually came out of reporting that I was doing on failures to report sexual abuse in schools. And as I was working on a broader story about why does this seem to keep happening, why are all these school officials not reporting these allegations to authorities as required by law, I had a source reach out and say, you really should look at USA Gymnastics and how it handles such allegations. And that phone call offered a suggestion of looking in Georgia, and there was a small case in Georgia that they had said might have records that would be helpful. And that started uh, me and my colleagues, Tim Evans and Mark Alicia, on a path of investigating not only USA Gymnastics and how it handled allegations, but also, as you were talking about, revealing the allegations of sexual abuse by Larry Nasser, who is now in prison for largely what is likely to be the rest of his life. And, and what was that, uh, how did you, at some point you talked to gymnasts who had been assaulted? How do you handle that as a reporter? So uh, every conversation is different because of the needs of the person you're interviewing are different, but I, I know you can talk about this as well, Sasha, but what I would tell students if you're looking to interview survivors of trauma, whether it's sexual abuse or some other kind of trauma, is first of all, over communicate on the front end. So make sure that the person understands why you're asking them to share this information with you and, and what the per larger purpose is behind it. So we were very upfront with people that we were looking at how USA Gymnastics handled these allegations. And so we wanted to ask very specific things. And also to the point that you were making earlier when we were investigating Larry Nasser, it was very important during our interviews with survivors to understand exactly what he did. And so we were asking incredibly intensely personal questions about 
What did he do with his hands? Where was he? What was happening? Who else was there? And asking people to share that information with us. And so, you know, we made a point to, again, over communicate at the front end why we were going to be asking those questions and that it wasn't because we didn't believe them or didn't think that what they're saying was accurate. So I, I want to bring Joe in. He, fascinating beat. You cover the intersection of sports, culture, and money for the New York Times. Uh, what, what is that like, and what do you make of, of the state of the state right now in, in, uh, in athletics? Well, Caitlin needed a bio, so I made that part up. <laughs> and uh, everybody said very good things here. Um, I started in news, and news is like crawling and walking before you run. If you have to go cover the Plano bus routes in Texas, you do it and it's hard to come up with an entertaining 600 words and informative. I like what Sasha said about the uh, beat or investigative. We're all investigative reporters. It kind of bugs me that people put that in front of their name. I mean, I was a beat guy. I'm still a beat guy. DA's a beat guy. Uh, it is what we do for a living. We're there to illuminate wrongs, rights, insights for the general public. Uh, I go back to growing up in Kansas City where I read the sports pages, I read Sports Illustrated, but I also read Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. I actually got grounded by my mother one summer, and the grounding was to read the great books, which were all of those. And it, it helped me develop sort of a worldview. And when I say that, the intersection, think about sports is the safe place mm -hmm. for the general public. I mean, think of Jackie Robinson. Nobody wanted to talk about integration, but it was baseball. Think of Renee Richards. Nobody really wanted to talk about that, but it was tennis and it was athletics. The steroid thing brought in that whole debate in there. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to write a few books and what I always say to my agent, and then my editor, and then to myself, and to my wife, and anybody else who will listen to me is, it transcends sports. And that's what you're kind of looking for. Uh, sports is a window into the culture, you know? And people don't, it isn't like Trump impeachment. It's like people have a common dialogue mm -hmm. about sports, mm -hmm. and it's not threatening. So, you know, to me, I'm always trying to look for stories that tell us more about us than what's actually going on in there. And you know, look, all these people have done great work. I mean, that's why I'm here and I wanna thank the school for having me down here. You know, I've read these guys, I've known some of them, and if you can't listen to Bob Lee and say, shit, I wish he was on one o'clock every day anymore. <laughs> I mean, you can narrate my funeral and make it all up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, for the students, I mean, I, that's, I hope a couple of, in Georgia's class, called me ahead of time, and, you know, why do you do this? It was an assignment, George, a good assignment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a mystery. You gotta listen to people. You take your time. That's what Maria was talking about. I tell journalism students the same thing. I go to career day at my son's grade school. I'm a journalist because A, I don't have to go to the office, B, I don't have to wear a tie, mm -hmm. and C, I meet somebody different every day and get to tell a different story. And all that is predicated on listening, being silent, asking questions, take your time with people. I mean, I'm sure as the evening goes on, we're getting to the weeds of how things are done, but it's basically paying attention and not being threatening and being confident that you can talk to anybody. I mean, what you guys done with sexual abuse victims, I mean, that's remarkable. And you just really can't walk into a room and say, tell me what happened, how'd he do it, what'd he do? I mean, that's a three week dialogue. So three months, three years. So, so I'd be curious to hear all of you talk about uh, one of the challenges that makes sports different is that sports can be an insular world, right? There is a locker room with a set of rules, mm -hmm. teammates who have bonds and codes. Mm -hmm. There are governing bodies. Uh, and then there is the mythical relationship between coach and athlete, which is one of the more 
uh, as we've seen, dangerous sort of power situations. How, how do you penetrate that as a journalist, and how do you get you know, some of these, get people to talk to you when it might not be the right thing to confide in a reporter? Uh, David, I'll let you go first. Well, I think the, you know, any good reporter, um, I think, in any genre of journalism, uh, is essentially, to Joe's point, someone who is really good at listening. Um, you have to listen. In our society today, everybody wants to talk because everybody thinks their opinion is important. And so you have to be the person that doesn't talk and just listens. And um, if you can do that, you know, you have a chance to be a very good reporter. Uh, it is about letting people present their witness to the world. Everybody wants to witness. Everybody wants to tell you, here's what happened, and here's why it happened. Everybody, in whatever field that they're in, and I don't think sports teams are any different, because everybody has their own turf to protect, their own reputation to protect. They want to make sure, and some people are genuinely want you to know what actually happened. Um, so I don't, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's not unknowable, I guess is what I would say. I mean, it's just a matter of presenting yourself as trustworthy over a period of time. These things do not happen overnight. You have to display over a period of time that you are someone that is not looking for the sensational headline, is not looking to take what someone said and run, call the radio station with it but can be trusted, and that is a process. And for people who are coming in from other parts of the newsroom, it, it can be difficult, I'm sure. Um, but I think for all of us, it, it's just a matter of consistently being trustworthy, I think Chill is the main out. thing. Chill enough, yeah. you gotta be there every day. Yeah. When you, when you put the wood to somebody, you gotta show up the next day, and right. let them tell you you're a no good son of a gun <laughs> and uh, you know and that's how you earn trust over a period of time because you're you're, you're in a, a situation now you're a prominent athlete you don't need to yep. talk yeah. to anyone here about mm -hmm. anything players tribune mm -hmm. your agent essentially can write a piece and edit it for you put your byline on it um, Trust in the media, I don't think it's at an all-time high. <laughs> so, you know, it, you, uh, getting, you know it, it's, it's establishing that trust on an interpersonal basis, but um, between, I mean, I, I've heard Adam Silver talk about this uh, concern about you walk into an NBA locker room after a game. D, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, and everybody, there's no music playing. Everyone's on their phone because what, they're looking to see what the idiots on Twitter have said about them. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the best 300 basketball players in the world. Mm -hmm. And you're worried what some nudnik with 19 followers has mm -hmm. just tweeted about you. <laughs> and Joey it's X not necessarily that young man's <laughs> fault, but that, that's, yeah. that is the, the dynamic, and that's the place where the media at least will begin to establish a relationship mm -hmm. in, that, in, in, that, in that locker room. That's a dynamic you're dealing with. They don't need us, they never, and less now than ever before, they can package themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we all waited for LeBron to talk after China, right, when that, after that story dropped. And we waited, what, five, six days? And when he spoke, he didn't have good staff help. <laughs> you know, he needed better help. Yeah. M Mark, I'm curious when uh, a general manager or an athlete gets a call from Mark Trainer or Uwada, uh, you're not doing a light puff piece on their charity <laughs> golf tournament. Uh, what, what is that like? Uh, <laughs> The, that first time you sit down, I, I'm assuming people are hiding under their desks when you walk in. What is what is that? The phone like? doesn't get answered too often, but it's. I, but I, I don't. I mean, I, I think, I, I think what Marissa said is really important because it's instructive. I think about all stories, like I, I, whether it's going after somebody hard or it's institutional or whatever. Like the transparency piece, I think is huge, mm -hmm. um, because I, I think on two two levels. There's two pieces though that I, what I wanted to say on, on the I, I think it's important to sort of tell whoever you're going after or whoever is the topic of your investigation. Ultimately, uh, you need to be transparent with them. I mean, I think when we when we did League of Denial and started to really explore football and brain damage and decided we were going to look at the NFL's handling of it, one of the first things we did was go to the NFL and uh, we flew to New York and we sat down with um, some talk of top sort of execs and PR people with the league, and we just laid out exactly what we were doing. And um, we said, 
we want your cooperation, we want to hear your perspective, and we'd like to know what you have to say. And I don't think that call happens always at the beginning of stories, in this case it did. And, um, and the league said ultimately thanks, but no thanks. But I, but I think that's all you do. I, but, I, but I also think, I think the transparency piece works with sources too in a, in a big way that, um, you know, I do think people want the truth to come out generally, or at least there's always somebody mm -hmm. when wrongdoing's going on. And I, I think to the extent that you can demonstrate to people that uh, not only this level of transparency, but a level of knowledge about the topic you're looking at. You know, when, when we started on steroids, neither Lance nor I really knew a lick about performance enhancing drugs in sports. And the same was relatively true when my brother and I started in on concussions in football. Um, but we just called a lot of people and educated ourselves. And I think once you start talking to those sources um, who have been living this, and demonstrating to them a level of knowledge and a level of interest and a level of caring and a level of humanity, um, then that goes a long way with people. And I think then they want to talk to you, whether it's abuse survivors or, um, or general managers or players or whatever. <coughs> I think people, the more they, val the more they trust that you actually care about what you're doing and have spent the time to really understand what they're doing and are generally interested, genuinely interested, I think the more likely they are to talk to you. And Sasha, does that ring true in outside sports as well? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's pretty well covered. I think it's about good listening and being genuine and being open about what you're doing. And I think sometimes we even, I, I sometimes feel like I end up protecting people from themselves because people can open up so much sure. that you then have to make judgment calls about what you actually put in the story and, uh, and whether it's gonna be damaging to them, perhaps because they've shared with you something they haven't told their family. And so I think there's a lot of judgment there. Yeah, this notion of, of covering something you don't know anything about or aren't really steeped in, I'd, I'd like to talk to Joe. If you haven't been reading Joe's coverage about horse racing and the deaths, unexplained or explained deaths of horses, uh, particularly in California, it's, it's been just jaw-dropping reporting, and there's a pretty good chance that horse racing does not recover uh, from this period. How did you get into that subject? Why horse racing? Why, how, you what, know, how in the world, what, it, what were you doing? Okay, I'm a degenerate gambler. <laughs> Isn't that redundant? <laughs> you know, I, your I, <laughs> I, grew, I grew up in, twice a year, my mom and dad went either to Hot Springs, which is Oaklawn Park, Clinton's track, or Axer Bend in Omaha, which was Nebraska spelled backwards. So every Thursday, my dad would te show me how to read the racing form. Fine teenage pursuit. I end up going off and having my career on the news side. I'm a national correspondent in Atlanta. I don't golf. I don't antique. I don't shop. So <laughs> like I, we're all stunned to hear you don't <laughs> antique. <laughs> so I went to racetracks, and I've gone to like 140 and 15 countries. At some point, I've owned them. I've, I've just knew a lot about it. Had no intention of ever covering it. Went to the Times as the college sports guy. Joe Durso was ahead of me. He retires suddenly. I had written a story out of Cajun country about bush tracks and Sunday afternoon bets. Neil Amder, who's a colleague of George's, or they're of the same era, said, okay, you cover horse racing. And it just was kind of fun the first five or six years. I'd go to the Kentucky Derby where you basically drink, gamble, watch a two-minute race, <laughs> and then bang out a story in 50 minutes. And the more I talk to anybody about it, it's all to the point we're talking about. People want to tell you their misgivings about mm -hmm. what they're doing and what their industry is doing. And, you know, I got very steeped on the ways to cheat how they're abusing animals. And you know, we, I did a strip series in 2012 that was, uh, you know, very comprehensive, but it's where the world is right now. Mm -hmm. We weren't animal lovers then, all right? It just kind of, the industry said, okay, we can kick this under the rug and keep moving and it won't come to haunt us. And what's happened in the last 18 months is this perfect storm of California where it's progressive, Things have gone terrible there. All these horses have died. They have a huge concentration of cheaters, which have been exposed by me and others. And people all of a sudden sort of cleared. And 
You know, good stories are good stories. That's what I tell the young journalists here. I mean, you, you may be interested in the latest badminton scandal, but if it's a scandal and you can tell it well, you're going to get critical mass. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just one of those accidental things. It kind of goes back to what we're all sitting up here for. We found a path and a passion. We, a lot of left turns. I mean, you know, I've lost jobs. I've done things and, you know. What kind of things? <laughs> no, no, that's for later. That's for later. Well, we'll, no, be on, we'll be at Bentley's the Route 1 later uh, if you want to come by. Well, you know, my line always, and I'm, then I'm going to give up the mic here, my line always has been about, oh, you're a great turf rider. I was like, that's being the world's tallest leprechaun right there. <laughs> I mean, not enough people care about it, but the people who care about it care about it deeply. So, th so there's something in common in all these, which is the governing bodies or, or the leagues or whoever's supposed to be in charge of this in one way or another, something slipped past them. Um, and, and certainly that was the case in the gymnastics story. And so the, the athletes, in a sense, one of the, some of the most compelling stuff from the athletes now that you hear is, we trusted USA Gymnastics, and they violated that trust. So as you, as you move from the athlete to the governing body and, and looking into there, what are you looking for as a reporter, and how are you trying to find where things went bad? Well, when we're looking at systemic failures, specifically as it relates to sexual abuse, we're looking at what are they supposed to do? What does the law require them to do? What do their own policies say they should be doing? And then what are they actually doing? So those three pieces of it. And I, I think Bob said it perfectly earlier, you know, USA Gymnastics, if you look at all of the statements that they had prior to our investigation, what they talked about was money and medals. They talked about the prestige and about advertising and about all of those things. And the athletes trusted the national governing body to protect them from people. And also it was an environment in which, if you know anything about gymnastics, it's subjective scoring and there's a group that picks the Olympic team. And so there was a lot of pressure on athletes to follow what they were being told to do and to not make waves. And that's been true really until very recently. And Mark, that rings sort of true to what the NFL has been facing with concussions, right? As they try to deal with a, a problem that could eventually destroy their sport, certainly it's affected the number of, of people who play. Uh, we're all doing stories about high school teams that have dropped from 50 players to, to 10. When, when you look at the NFL's role in the concussion thing, what, what do you see? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, <laughs> the only reason I'm hesitating right now as I'm thinking back to this, we were laughing about this earlier. Bob Costas was here two years ago. And, here uh, comes the viral moment. And you guys asked about, like, what's the biggest story in sports? And Bob said exactly what the biggest story in sports is. And then he talked about brains being destroyed. And then he got kicked off the Super Bowl. It's Bob Costas. So I'm, I'm a little he reticent. He would take issue with that I chronology. like my job. Yeah, I know. Anyway, I, I think the league, I think it's hard for anybody to look at the history of the league and not look, and not suggest that they were complicit. I mean, I just think that's the simple answer. They were complicit in this. They spent decades doing two things. Basically, they sort of uh, suggested they had no problem, suggested that football was not gonna be causing brain damage and that their sport wasn't really an issue and that they knew better than everybody else on this and that the research didn't bear out. And then they attacked anybody who suggested otherwise. And they also sort of seemed to go about trying to create some of their own science. Yeah. So they modeled, you know, in some ways they modeled the tobacco industry and their efforts to sort of um, shit on the idea that, that cigarettes could cause cancer. The difference, of course, is that, you know, nobody really now misses the fact that you can't smoke on an airplane. Um, but if you got rid of football, and this is the sort of existential place we're at right now, is, you know, a lot of people would miss it, including me. Um, you know, 100 million people watch the Super Bowl. And I just went, I was at Michigan last week. My brother's kid goes to to Michigan and uh, he'd been trying to get me to go to a game and so I flew out to Ann Arbor and they were playing Notre Dame and uh, it was pouring rain and it was cold and uh, 111,000 people showed up mm -hmm. without any qualms about showing up. And so, uh, but I, but I, so I think there's two issues and the NFL is, you know, they're, they're scrambling like any other major business that feels a threat to it. They're scrambling to figure out how to deal with it and I, and I think it's, it's hard to sort of look at it 
like people say, oh, well, like boxing died, and well, maybe horse racing is going to die or whatever. I mean, this is a $15 billion industry that's, that the commissioner has said he wants to be a $25 billion industry in the not too distant future. And, and I, I, I think the question is going to become for the NFL is going to be much more of a question at the youth level and sort of what happens that's feeding it. The Times, Joe, they just did a really, um, the beginning of a project that looked at the participation rates much more closely than anybody else has. We'd seen that the rates were dropping at the youth level, um, you know, by about 10 to 11 percent. Um, but when you looked at it state by state, it was remarkable. You know, Ohio, Ohio, Bastion football was at 27 percent, right, of the drop in, in youth football. So I think the NFL and the NCAA by extension are looking at that issue and trying to figure out how to navigate those changes and, and struggling and grappling with, you know, uh, whether there's anything to do to fix it. And, and I think what's lost on most people is that it's not really a concussion issue. It's a repetitive trauma issue. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is the sort of existential issue that the league faces and how do they navigate through that. And I don't, I don't know that they've figured it out. I don't know that anybody will. So Yet every major broadcast corporation or entity and those that are in streaming will line up mm -hmm. with the Brinks truck Right. Back it up sure. as we're getting to the concentration period of years where you'll go in and negotiate again, whether it's streaming, whether it's broadcast, whether it's cable over the air, to pay whatever the increase is, the number that's floated, because it's the most popular and important television property. It's the one place, live events, that congregate people unlike anything else in, a, in the fractured marketplace. And at the same time, I, I, the numbers in the New York and Joe in that series is stunning. The graphics, check it out on your phone or on your on your on your tablet. I mean, what the Times produced is, is remarkable. I mean, you know, we've seen the national numbers. You guys dove deep, but I still believe. I mean, whether they want 25 billion dollars by 2027 is Goodell's stated goal. There's still enough people to play major college football and mm -hmm. and staff the league. I mean, put a team in London. Mm -hmm. I mean. You know, maybe they've peaked. Maybe I don't think they have, but maybe there's a plateauing. But they're, you know, they're moving overseas. And let me jump in on a few of all these things they've said. Uh, the demographics—it's complicated. And it's not going to be solved. I, my only child, just finished his freshman football season. I've written two books about football. Like Mark, I like football. I'm mm -hmm. a Kansas City Chiefs fan. I would even go further to say, for 99.9% of 18-year-old males, their career in football ends in November of their senior year after playing about 40 games, okay? But that's not who we're talking about with the CTE stuff. I mean, if you're going to Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, and on to the NFL, nobody can deny banging your head against a big guy every day in practice repetitively is not gonna do you damage. And so what we've seen in these numbers they were talking about is the demographic shift. It's much go more going to uh, what the minority less low income. low income. We got a story coming. It'll probably be next from Ken Belson, our NFL guy, about how tackle football in Marshall, Texas, they eliminated it from seventh to ninth grade because they thought it was too dangerous. And the African-American community came in and said, oh, we're restarting it because scholarships mean something. And it's like taking off like big gangbusters. So, you know, it, it's, it's messy, it's complicated, it's become sort of like UFC, boxing, horse racing, look who ends up going into these things. It's also, you know, and Bob honestly said it, Mark honestly said it, DA honestly said it, you've got too much money on the line for anybody to walk away. I mean, you know, ESPN can move outside the lines to once a week on Saturday and still pay gazillions for their rights thing. With your governing bodies, I mean, what I find is leagues and governing bodies, I mean, their whole deal is to keep you out and to, you know, make a shitload of money. That's, that's <laughs> all they care about. and. They will now stonewall us. All the stuff you see in the newspaper about politics right now has been going on in the leagues for decades now, you know? NBA is the Instagram league. And mm -hmm. 
Now they got caught in China and they just got caught with their pants down. They didn't know exactly how to handle that because they've generated so much good PR. Uh, you know, LeBron James, it's funny you guys brought that up. I mean, I remember LeBron James' media guy was Schwarzenegger's press secretary. And they orchestrate a sit-down interview. Like, they sit you in the dark, and then all of a sudden, a light backdrop comes in, and this 6'8 guy comes in, and you got six minutes. You know this. Oh, you, you sat through mm -hmm. most of it. it oh, it's, sure. Third question, wrap it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, it, that, <laughs> that, that's exactly, yeah. It, it's, yeah. you know, it's a changing landscape. That's why uh, young people right now, I think sports is the way to go because you can, you can, make some hay in sports. Right. Well, I, I want to go to another, besides the passion for the sport, Sasha, y you spent a lot of your life in Boston, and you understand how a team can become part of the city's culture. Certainly, uh, Mr. Brady's relationship with the city is unique uh, in the world right now. And so it goes beyond the sport, right? It, it goes to part of the town's identity, and, and here you are doing an investigative piece on, on part of that identity. What, what did you make of all that? Right, I mean, Boston is obviously a giant sports town. I mean, the Boston Globe is even owned by John Henry, the owner of the Red Sox, so the, the, you know, the, the connections are deep. I was thinking about something, uh, when I was thinking about how Tom Brady is so much identified with Boston, I want to pose this as a question, particularly for the students in the room. About a decade ago, uh, the Globe, a Globe reporter who basically wrote for our gossip column got a tip that Tom Brady, who at the time was dating the actress Bridget Moynihan, was now dating the supermodel Giselle Bunkin. And the second piece of the tip was, Bridget Moynihan was pregnant with Tom Brady's child. So Bridget's pregnant, Tom is now dating Giselle. It's not a bad, it's not a bad little tip. If any student in the, in the audience is willing to, to field this question, what do you do? You're the editor of the Globe. Is that a story? Where does the story go? What, what do you do with that information? Anyone willing to say how you might make that call? What was that? <laughs> I, I, okay, I missed it. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Called TMZ. You don't, so you don't even think it's globe, a globe story? It's pre-TMZ. <laughs> yeah. Personally, I feel like whoever said call TMZ is on the right track. That's more of a TMZ type story. It's not really important to Tom Brady or like his job, his career, or the team. It's not really important to anything. So that's really just a piece you put out to start drama, basically. <laughs> Okay. Can, can I do one thing? Can I ask people in the crowd, how many of you would read that story? Uh. <laughs> and, and click on it, right? Yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> Anybody else have an opposing view? Would you deal with that story differently? Paul Maury. Paul Maury, he said. Can you, can uh, you say it more loudly? Or stand. <laughs> How do you mean that, they'd ask in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Globe chose to put the story on the front page above the fold. It is a controversial decision to this day. I thought it was the wrong decision. But that is the role of sports in Boston and Tom Brady in Boston. Front page above the fold, above the fold Boston Globe. Uh, now the Globe, the Globe, I think, also has been, you know, the, Bob Holer is a wonderful sports reporter for the Boston Globe who has done some very controversial stories. One of them was about Tom Brady, a big charity that he's involved with in Boston, is Best Buddies that helps people with intellectual disabilities. Tom is kind of the public face of Best Buddies. Bob Holler did a story about how Tom has his own charitable trust. Typically, if you're a wealthy celebrity athlete, you fund your own char charitable trust. Tom has an arrangement where Best Buddies gives money, I think it's been about $3 million to date, to Tom's charitable trust. Some of that charitable trust money then goes to Tom's uh, college where he went, his kids' private schools, some of the charities of his other athletes. So Bob's story was about, is that, uh, it's not illegal, but is that an appropriate arrangement? Mm -hmm. And if Best Buddies calls that a charitable donation, should that really be, for tax purposes, be classified as a fundraising expense because you're giving money to Tom's charity in order to get Tom to do fundraising for you? So I think even, even though it's a sports town, it's not just all hey geography, it's not just all mm -hmm. happy stories. I mean, even with, and even being owned by the Red Sox, we do tough stories about about the Sox. Dan Shaughnessy is this great columnist for the Globe who's a total thorn in John Henry's side, but mm -hmm. John's never fired him, so the, the firewall stays there. What happened um, to the sports department's relationship and, 
and the beat guys uh, after Newside put that out tomorrow. The Brady story. That, that, uh, not that anyone is forthcoming or well sourced right. uh, in New England anyway, but uh, did yeah. the Iron Curtain come down even on somebody's toe for a little bit? I don't know. It was so long ago, yeah. and I don't think I remember that. But it was. Um, but that's that is considered major front page news in Boston. Well, there's a guy who had a movie series done by um, the Chopra. Uh, that's, the Tom versus Time. Yes. So you're taking people inside your house. Yeah. You forfeited your privacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll do it for for pay. So at what point? You know, can you segment all parts of your life, or you can see, you can be with with my wife and kids when we're doing this. In the car coming home from the game, but that part you can't, you know, it's mm -hmm. DMZ. Where'd they play the best buddy story? I think that was front page as well. Hmm. And why do you, what was your objection to playing the, the cheating story on the front page? I mean, I felt like it, that's probably a gossip column item at best, or maybe a sports front story. I, I, do you think it belongs on the front page? I, I haven't thought about it till you just <laughs> brought it up, but, but I wanted to see what you, you thought about it. I just felt like, how is that page one above the fold news? It just, you know. Well, but, but it is page part of a trend, Boston. right? So <laughs> those of us that don't live in Boston would say it's, it, it's obvious, mm -hmm. you know. But, but athletes now are now bigger than, you know, they are almost de facto corporations themselves, right? I think Brady, is, is, you look at Tom Brady and you see somebody who might run for president one day. You look at LeBron and you see a mm -hmm. multifaceted corporation who has his own talk show. Mm -hmm. So you've seen this a lot in the, in the NBA. I think it sort of started with magic a little bit. The, the emergence of the sort of super sports figure who then transcends his sports, uh, nobody better than, uh, than Michael Jordan. Well, yeah, I was going to say it was, it was Michael, really, because, you know, Michael was the first African-American athlete to sell anything in the volume in which he sold shoes. I mean, black athletes didn't sell products to white America for decades. It just wasn't even, wasn't even done. I, when I, I did a story on David Stern when he retired, it, and it's, you all have done much, better, much more important investigative journalism than I have, but that took two years for me to do, to talk to everybody. One of the things I remember talking to Adam Silver about and Russ Granick about was that they literally would call black people the special marketing department. You know, you have to go to the special events department, you know, because that's, that's where we sell things to black people. Uh, so Michael Jordan was the first crossover athlete of any magnitude um, to sell products and to um, kind of sell lifestyle, you know, whether it's the, the the suit he wore, and then every player in the NBA started wearing suits, shaved his head, everybody in the league started shaving their head, he put baggy shorts on, he did everything. Everything he did, everybody copied, and nobody other than Allen Iverson has had that kind of sway, in my opinion, um, in terms of culturally and also economically. And as top spelling, Michael Jordan stopped playing basketball in 2003, he still sells more shoes than anybody else <laughs> on earth. Um, so, yeah, he was the first, and to your point, when I remember when Dave Anderson at the Times wrote a column about Michael Jordan gambling uh, in Atlantic City the night before a playoff game, um, created a great amount of controversy. And basically, that was the beginning of the end of Michael talking to any, anyone other than Ahmad Rashad. Um, he just cut everybody off. And if he had something to say, he would tell Ahmad Rashad on NBC. And that's how we all found out what Michael was thinking about a given topic, because he was so powerful that he could literally tell the NBA, I'm not doing your press conference. I'm not doing it. Uh, and that's when you started to see, you know, the, the NBA still is a very powerful organization, but there are people who are so beloved that they can kind of set the terms by which they cooperate with the league on everything. Um, and... LeBron, to a certain extent, does that now, but, you know, he still is available, quote unquote, it's just not for very long, um, and he is going to dictate how he talks about whatever it is he talks about. The, the China example was a rare one where I think that he was trying to make, he was trying to thread the eye of a very, 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 very small needle with what he said. He did it right and he didn't come close though. Yeah, right? exactly. He totally messed yeah. it. He totally, totally messed it up. And he was trying to protect, you know, he, 
LeBron said when he was 21, Warren Buffett's my idol. I want to be a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> so you, to be a billionaire, you have to do business in China. Point blank. So there is a blowback, though, right? There is, at some point, there are people who um, believe pretty strongly that athletes shouldn't stray, the shut-up-and-play crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious what the panel thinks of that phenomenon, and which inevitably leads us to Colin Kaepernick, a unbelievably talented quarterback in a league uh, that has a lot of bad quarterbacks who can't find a team uh, because, of a, because of a political stance. And so how does the panel put that into perspective as we look at sports in, uh, in 20, going into 2020? I was on a similar panel last night and a question from the floor from a student at Seton Hall, my alma mater, um, and it's good to hear this kind of intellect at work. And the question I asked Bob Costas and I was, if Colin Kaepernick had knelt to protest the lack of veterans benefits, hmm? how would that have played? I mean, there's no rational, does anyone rationally doubt he was blackballed out of the league? I mean, no. regardless yeah. of where you stand politically, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, any, clearly, I, I, even if it just came down to we don't want the circus in town if we hire him as our backup quarterback. Uh, but it, invo it involves, I mean, what, what, what would the reaction be in the mainstream media and on the blogosphere if a player made a statement on the field in favor of pro-life or the Second Amendment? Turn it on its end. I would, I would have loved to have seen something like that. You have a lot of people reassessing, well, wait a minute, where, I, where am I on this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. The detail of the Kaepernick thing that amazes me is he did this for like four or five games yeah. before anybody noticed. It I was mean, he did, he, a white he, photograph. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he didn't say, I'm doing this. Yeah. And there's no doubt he was blackballed. Yeah. No, no, no doubt. doubt. And what do we think the role of, of social media plays in something like this? Is it, it would this have happened to, to Kaepernick 15 years ago when there was no internet and people were reading, you know, the news every day? Or is it part of our culture now where information is flying and, and it's easy to build up a mob to go ahead and go after somebody? Well, it happened, it happened to Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Sure. I mean, uh, long before he's an NBA player, played for the Nuggets. Set. Nuggets, mm -hmm. exactly. And, uh, and he had chosen not to, to stand for the anthem and, and did it for a while, similar to Kaepernick, before actually anybody sort of made a deal out of it and did a story. And then, you know, I think ultimately he was out of the league. And I, I think a lot of people believe he was blackballed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, so I, but I think that I, I, the thing I find fascinating, I mean, there's no question. I, I mean, I, again, I'm with everybody. There's no question. You, you can't even make a rational argument anymore that he wasn't the Kaepernick's not blackballed, but I do. Th I think what has changed, which I think is fascinating around this, beyond Bob's question is, and, and David has much more insights into this than I, I think all of us at the table do. But um, <coughs> this is a different animal at the NBA level. The, the players really run the league now in a way that any other sport. That's not the case. Um, in the NFL, somebody's asking me earlier, like, do I still watch football? And you know, given what I know about brain damage and all that, and I, I still do. I still love the sport. And, but I said, one of the, uh, increasingly, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by football, but it's more for these reasons. And the NFL sort of haughtiness and the way it deals with these issues or sexual abuse issues or, or domestic violence issues. Um, but in the NBA, I think now, this, though the players got together and figured out how to deal with this mm -hmm. issue, there's no question that any players could have done whatever they wanted probably, I think, now as opposed to Abdul Raouf back in the, the, the 90s, don't you think? Or, yeah, probably. They have more control, certainly. They certainly have more control, but there's fewer of them. I mean, basketball's completely different just because you can actually see the players. Yes. It's, it's a huge yeah. difference. And so there's a visceral kind of reaction to seeing a basketball player as opposed to seeing someone, as Seinfeld famously said, we root for laundry in the NFL, right? And that's what you do. You root for the color of the team you're playing. You don't even know who's in the jersey. You don't see him. You have no idea. Does anybody know what Jimmy Garoppolo looks like? I don't know. <laughs> you, do you really know? I mean, you know what Tom Brady looks like, but most people, even star players in the NFL, and hockey certainly, you don't know who they are. 
you know? So basketball is different in that regard. And basketball players, because there's fewer of them on the, on the team and on the court, certainly have an outsized amount of influence uh, because one great player can literally take you to a championship. And that's not true in most of the other sports. And let's be honest, look at the context Kaepernick happened in. I mean, what was going on in the country, the world? Who jumped on that controversy and tried to own it? Uh, you know, it's just a different world. And there's very savvy people, elected, owned teams that used it to their advantage, and there were savvy people on the other side who tried to use it to their advantage. I mean, it should not have been a thing, really, if you think about it, but it, he's got the highest Q factor. More people know who he is than anybody else in the NFL. So when you talk about the power of players, um, I, I, I think if I look out that window, I can see the, the University of Maryland's half-built new football facility mm -hmm. that they're going to glom onto the new Cole Field House, <laughs> which they've made into another football facility that Correct. is right <laughs> next to the stadium that's been expanded a few times. Hmm? So pretty quickly we get to this issue of NCAA players and whether or not they should make money off of their likenesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to go really quickly down the panel, and anybody who wants to, to jump in and answer this question as well, do we think NCAA players should be able to make money off their likenesses? Do you think they should be able to get paid? Where do each of you stand? Sasha, I'm going to let you go first. Mm -hmm. I think I do I have to pass on this one, probably because I haven't thought deeply enough about it. But I do guest hosting sometimes, and I hosted an hour of On Point recently for NPR about this issue. So I was so, in, in researching, I was so steeped in both sides that I ended up coming kind of firmly down the middle. I mean, I do think, I think it's pretty clear that the schools are enriching themselves with basically free labor. So there has to be a way to remedy that. But then I'm not sure how you remedy the new problems that are caused by paying the athletes. Bob? This latest uh, attempt by the NCAA, I think it's a holding action because mm -hmm. it, it, it's been an incremental retreat bit by bit with the NCAA. You're just one judge away from that one decision. It's going to take you from incremental change to ac apocalyptic change. Uh, this was, again, a, a, a subject on the panel with some student athletes last night. It was brought up by a cross-country runner. And I said, well, how much money is at stake for you? And the answer is none. Mm -hmm. uh, even mm -hmm. do you, the Alabama third-string long snapper, what do you think he's going to make? Um, clearly, and the coach makes what? And 10, 11 million dollars? They need to be paid. All of this under the rubric is, oh, by the way, there's a free education available to you if you'd like to take avail take, you know, make, a, make yourself a, you know, a advantage of that. Uh, while parents struggle to finance the education of non-athletes. Uh, um, yes, they need to be paid. And it's, this will be seen in another 18 months as a, a minor issue because more change is coming. Well, actually, to, to add to something Bob said about the holding pattern, one of the things I do think is interesting, it was California that passed mm -hmm. this law. And it basically looked as if it was effort to push the NCAA to address this issue, right? Because yes. suddenly you can't be the only state that's going to pay people. So it forced, it forced the league to, to, to act. Marissa, I'm curious, to so your point of view, you dealt with a bunch of amateur athletes, right, who have bizarre rules on how to stay amateur and <laughs> what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, right? Yeah, so I'm going to have to pass because uh, the NCAA is based in Indianapolis, and I never know what I'm going to get pulled into investigating, <laughs> so safer for me to just bow out. <laughs> So, Mark? I mean, I think it's funny because you are asking us for an opinion, and nobody, nobody pays me at ESPN for my opinion. So, I mean, the only thing I will say is that I do think, so yeah, I think players should get paid in some fashion. I think the system, but I, I think it's a much larger actual issue that the, the system is, is so broken, like that this is not really just about payer, players getting paid. Like the system is broken when a college coach is getting $5 million a year. It just is. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I... I, I Your offensive five. coordinator is yeah, getting yeah, whatever, $5 million ten. a year. <laughs> so, like, I, I was at Syracuse recently, and I know a kid who's a walk-on there. And, um, and so we had coffee, and I was just talking with him about what's your day like and what are your, what's your week like. And it was obscene. I mean, he's a walk-on. He's mm -hmm. not traveling with the team. The amount of time and energy he's spending as a football player is... is not consistent with an academic situation. I don't care what anybody says. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just not normal. So the system is far more broken than just the idea of whether you're going to pay a player or not, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Joe? 
I was at SMU in the 80s, and we oh, paid God. our players, and we, and we were pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sure will cheat. <laughs> the marker so pay them and pay them well? <laughs> that is your philosophy? No, and, yeah, and what Mark said, I mean, they say there's a 20-hour rule. They own these guys year-round. Sure. You know, they're there all summer. They're in the workout room. They're in films. I mean, I, it, coaches, Coach K can get 11 million. We can't throw 40 grand. To these guys, I think it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, this is a, this is it's it is a no-brainer. Of course, the players the players should be paid. Um, it is not going to destroy Title IX. That is complete nonsense. It's not going to destroy Title IX. Um, every college town is going to be different. The people that get paid at the University of Alabama are going to be different than the people who get paid at the University of Connecticut. They're going to be different. Why? Because at the University of Connecticut, the women's basketball team sells out the building every night. So they're going to get paid. You know, so I think that if you're, if you're a local merchant and you want to do a deal with the best player on the, on the college team, well, guess what? That's going to be Rebecca Lobo at UConn, you know, or, or it's going to be Diana Taurasi at UConn. It's not going to be the kicker on the football, the quarterback on the football team. So every city, every college is going to be different in how they pay the players, but they should pay the players. You know, our friend Bill Roden has a great example of this. If you are a sophomore at Maryland and you're first chair in the Baltimore Symphony, you can make 40 grand and play and go to school at the Absolutely. same time. Why, why shouldn't somebody with the talent in a sport be able to do that? Absolutely. All right, you've been standing there a very long time, yes, so sir. thank you. <laughs> not exactly sure what, uh, where you, what, what part of the conversation <laughs> you want to jump in on, but go ahead. Uh, my name is Mark Hyman. I, I teach at George Washington University, mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate the work of everyone on this panel. Every professional sports league has a news organization, or, or what could be described as a, a news organization, and every professional team does as well. I wonder whether, how you view that and whether you think that in some way is insulating professional sports from the kind of investigative reporting that we're talking about tonight. You okay. mean the PR departments that, that they have? You mean like Redskins.com covering the team? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's Redskins.com, yeah, but, no, but I also mean MLB.com, yeah. sure. which has MLB Network. Dozens of well, well, reporters will, yeah, working I'll, for them. I, I will say this as somebody who worked for NBA TV and NBA.com. I worked there for 14 years. In 14 years, the NBA called me about one thing. They didn't want me to mention, they didn't want me to report on undergraduates who were thinking about declaring for the draft. And I said, that's absurd. There's nothing but undergraduates who are declaring for the NBA draft. <laughs> and a year later, they said, you're right. Go ahead and write about whatever you want. That's the only time I heard from the NBA in 14 years. And I can guarantee you, as somebody who covered every lockout from 1998 through the last one, and as somebody who got cursed out on a regular basis by David Stern when I wrote the things I wrote on NBA.com about the league and about, and about the negotiations, that that was not an issue for me. Now, I cannot speak for other people. I can just tell you my experience in 14 years of writing about the league was nobody ever told me what to write, ever suggested anything other than that one thing. I mean, I would, I would only just say that I think like, you know, as I think Bob mentioned this earlier, that clearly whether it's through Players' Tribune or um, other sort of what, you know, whether it's the league websites, whatever it is, the, the athletes in the leagues have become much more expert at getting messages out, but I don't think that's changes. The issue, again, comes back to, I think, what I said at the onset, it's, it's money, and do we have the money to do the kind of reporting that we do? And it's not cheap, and, and there's only a handful of places that are continuing to commit the kind of money to doing it. Um, and as the industry continues to consolidate, it gets worse and worse, particularly at the local levels, and I think that's where the you know, that's where the dearth of the reporting is, is, is really problematic. I would, I would point out one more thing. The person who broke the Colin Kaepernick story was Steve Weiss, who works for NFL Network. He was the first person that interviewed Colin Kaepernick about it. Yeah, and I would add that I think the leagues, 
don't really control anything because of social media. I think every major player now has advisors who, who handle their social media and they're getting their own messages out and sometimes it's uh, in agreement with the league but other times it's just on their own. And, and so it, 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 I don't think that, we were worried at one point I think about, about these league websites sort of uh, becoming uh, P, giant PR outfits and I think instead that hasn't happened because I don't think anybody would read them if they were just clearly, you know, that, that PR oriented. But it is true when it comes to major investigations, you're probably not going to see it on a league website. I, I'm, I'm with you. The danger on this is not what the reporters and editors are doing. It's the public getting used to saying, well, shit, the Washington Post is fake news. I'm going to go to redskins.com. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Arrowhead Pride. I mean, mm -hmm. they condition the consumer to say we're the gospel and all these other guys are out to get us. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the culture we live in right now mm -hmm. and on all things. So that, to me, that's the biggest threat. Well, Mark and I were, were speaking earlier about, the, you know, head trauma coverage and, and the issue of repetitive head trauma in football. You're really not going to see extensive coverage of head trauma at NFL.com. Well, and, again, and I would Lots push, of people rely I, on NFL.com football fans as a primary source of news. I would push back on that because my dear friend Andrea Kramer works for the NFL Network and she covers head trauma. That's what well, she covers I'd, for I'd them. I'd be interested to hear Mark respond to that. I mean, again, I, look, I guess I would just say, like, one, I'm not going to go ripping anybody else, so, uh, but I, but I, and I, 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 you know, Andrea has done phenomenal work around the head trauma issue. Um, but I think if you're, I just think plainly, if you're relying on, uh, this is true of any sort of entity. I think if you're relying on something that is funded by the league, there's a conflict. There is a conflict. But, but, but I will be the first to admit, and we live through this with League of Denial, we have a massive conflict at ESPN. I mean, the network pays billions of dollars to air uh, yes, NFL games as well as NBA games as mm -hmm. well as baseball games. So like those conflicts exist for virtually everyone at the table in some fashion or another. Sure. And so I think the question is, you know, in the end, what is management doing about those conflicts? And, you know, we ended up in our own sort of kerfuffle around, or kerfuffle, sorry, around mm -hmm. League of Denial. And, and I always tell people, you know, it's a mess in many ways. Journalistically, it was a bad look because the ESPN decided they were going to take their name off a documentary. But I always say, like, two things can be equally true. It was a bad look for the company journalistically, but at the same time, the journalism never faltered. Like, we, the, the network continued to, to uh, we continued to cover the story. The network aired the documentary excerpts. The network ran excerpts of our book. The network still committed to the story. So I, I think in the end, it's just really about how all these entities choose to address the issues and. And, and I, I, you know, I can't, I'm going to be a broken record, but like as, as conflicted as ESPN is or as conflicted as the NFL is, if someone's paying me money to do investigative reporting that nobody else is doing, then, then there's something there. You know? And Bob, you, you would know, right? I mean, you had a show for a very long time that went into yeah. very, very difficult areas of a lot of the, a lot of the sports you cover. It, look, we call it the Berlin Wall uh, or the wall of, Great Wall of China between editorial and the political and business interests. And only at the very top of the company, traditionally, is one person or several people at the senior executive level astride both sides of it to work that line, to let a business partner know that something's coming. And, you know, and business partners know if that's the case, if you're working on an investigative piece, if you've done your job as a journalist, you've knocked on the front door. They know you're doing it. Just, uh, Mark, you described the meeting you had with the National Football League. Um, it is, uh, it, 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 at times it just feels like a trope uh, that you can't investigate or in report on those on business partners. And I just say bull, it's, that's not the case, um, but you're always fighting that perception. But there are uncomfortable moments. Sure. Uh, collegiate sports, I, I've heard the firsthand reports of uh, people who work on events in years past for our company will do a story on, on school A or, or conference B and then your good friend who's a game producer has to go down there on Thursday and spend four days in town getting ready for the big football game and you've made his life a little, you know, you've, you've made a little bit sticky down there. Mm -hmm. 
the best of your colleagues will stand there and say, don't worry, we got your back, I understand what you're doing. And my understanding, it, you know, when I was with the network, and I don't think it's changed that much, is that there's an editorial uh, producer uh, or oversight person assigned to that remote broadcast to make sure it's so you'll see, you know, yeah, you're paying up tens of millions of dollars maybe to do that football game that day, but if there's something percolating about that game, it's going to be on, on the broadcast, properly packaged, not in the middle of third and seven. Oh, by the way, we're going to tell you about it now. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it, it is an easy stone to throw, but quite often I think it, it misses the point. So Lucy, you're Thank back, you you're very back much. there. Yes, I, that's me. It's me, yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question for Sasha and Marissa. Uh, I would like to know, uh, both of you previously in your careers have done a lot of work that's not involved in sports and you've done investigative pieces. What, is the biggest, what are the biggest differences in covering investigative sports stories versus regular investigative stories like investigating the Catholic Church in Boston? I don't, uh, I'll speak for myself, I don't think there is a difference. I, I think Joe was talking about it earlier, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of great investigative reporting that comes out of beat reporting too. I don't think there's any difference, um, you know, we're looking at a different entity, yes, but I don't think there was any difference between the work we did on USA Gymnastics and investigating a sports entity versus when we've investigated businesses or government malfeasance. Did the, did the businesses react the same way yeah. gymnastics did? Were there yeah. any differences? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, USA Gymnastics, so when our first article came out, this is before Larry Nasser, but when our first article about their systemic failures to report sexual abuse came out, um, you know, they issued a press release saying we do great things and um, we are the, you know, at the forefront of protecting children and uh, Indie Star, I'm paraphrasing, of course, wasn't very nice to us. Left out key facts, I think, was part of it. But we've seen that same thing come out of governments, politicians, mm -hmm. businesses. That doesn't change. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Marissa said. I think it's the same type of reporting and the same playbook in terms of how the organizations you're looking at react. Question up front. Yeah. Um, my name's Anav. I'm a sophomore in high school. Um, my question to the panel is kind of like the dean said, um, we have this new, or not so new anymore, but the internet is like an, a medium that allows everyone to say whatever they want about whoever they want, whatever they want, basically. Like, how do you, like, particularly with the NCAA and the Kaepernick, those two things, like how do you guys as journalists navigate that, like deliver good journalism that's unbiased when all those people around you can say, like can say whatever they want, whatever mm -hmm. they think as their own opinions? Right, well, I would say this, everybody in this room is has leanings, right? We all believe certain things based on our backgrounds and everything, right? What, we, what reporters have to do, though, is that they have to put those things to the side. I grew up in D.C. Nobody was a bigger fan of the Redskins than me. Nobody. <laughs> but when I was 28 years old, I had to cover them. So you had to stop being a fan. Mm -hmm. You just have to stop. It's just part of the job of being fair. Nobody is not going to, nobody is objective. Forget that. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. But what you have to be is fair mm -hmm. to whomever you're covering. And that means you have to eliminate all of that social media noise and talk to people, right? You talk to, it's just people. That's why I tell young reporters all the time, you're just talking to people. You're not talking to elephants or, you know, you're talking to human people. Just talk to them like people, like you talk to your friends, talk to them. <laughs> and you just happen to be recording it this time, <laughs> you know? So that if you, Put all that other stuff aside, it's really, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, where do you get your news? Do you get on Snapchat in the morning? Or? No. Um, I try to like have things that I know they lean to both sides, so I get something that's a bit more objective. Um, but I don't use Snapchat and stuff. I use actual news websites. Such as what? Um, I try to, to stick to ABC, CBS, mm -hmm. right. stuff like that. So I have a slightly different perspective, which is I think that our job remains the same, despite all the noise of social media, but your job becomes harder 
because you have to sort through all that noise and try to figure out what's credible and what do I believe. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if people are going to be a, a good news consumer today, you have to read a lot of different things on a lot of different sides and really try to measure, is what I'm reading here credible? It sounds like you're doing that, which is great. I don't think most people are going to take the time to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really tough about today. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are confused. And I think sometimes the reaction is, I'm just not going to read anymore. I'm just going to stop. And that's not a great answer either. Mm -hmm. But you're doing the right thing. It's a fire hose of content, right? Yeah. You fire. could spend all day consuming, mm -hmm. consuming from reputable sources. I, I always mention this to some of our panelists. Sir. I think that one of the more important decisions you can make if you've got a smartphone, what are the alerts you set on it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you need to be that, you know, if you're you know, Jones and that bad for news, you need to know on a minute by minute basis. Yeah. You know, you know, set, whether it's the Times or the Post or whatever, ABC, ESPN, mm -hmm. set your alert. But you have to make, you have to do your homework to be mm -hmm. an educated news consumer Form and your own citizen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what all Thank these you. people have in common up here uh, is they live and die in relentless pursuit of the truth um, mm -hmm. and facts. And if you block everything out and you just focus on facts and what really happened and your reporting just bears down on that, you will find amazing things. Everything else is a distraction. Mm -hmm. Just fo what all these people did in their great work is they just had a relentless pursuit of trying to figure out why. Why are the horses dying? Why are the kids getting molested? Mm -hmm. Why did Aaron Hernandez turn out the way he did? and you just bear down on the truth. And those are the people you should follow, people who are truth tellers. They're not always gonna get it right. Not every single thing we report is gonna be right. But we will die trying to get that, that fact exactly right. Question in the back? Yeah, this has uh, been a great panel. I was a sports writer for more than 20 years and I really respect all the people up here and I even know a couple of them a little bit. Um, and uh, I've been watching Bob since about ninth or 10th grade. So congrats on a wonderful career. Oh, come on. You set the standard. <laughs> you see this well, gray well, hair? You don't know, know. later, you're in ninth or 10th grade. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. I said Bob, you're 108 thing. years old, yeah, Bob. <laughs> It's the beard. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love what David said about just talking to people. Um, I'm, I guess I'm lucky, unless it's Bruce Springsteen, I never got very starstruck. Right. So just talking to people, you'd be amazed how much it'll help you do your job. Uh, Joe, uh, I shared a couple of Churchill Downs press boxes with you back in the day, and I know you know horse racing is better than anybody. So I've got to ask you, how did you break, as much as you can tell us, how did you break that story on the Triple Crown winner and the failed drug test? Because I think that's the most overlooked breaking story in sports in the last year. Uh, I, I think it got overlooked with everything that's going on at Santa Anita. But that is, when I was reading that, my mind was blown. So fill me out on how you did that. Well, let's call him or her right now. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it, I had 20 years in it. And 20 years of people reading what I was doing and what discerning what my leanings were and my line of reporting. I mean, nobody, anybody, you know that I've been on the drugs and the safety for 20 years. Reporting on yes, covering yeah. the drugs, Joe. <laughs> Joe was covering the drugs, not on the drugs, Joe. Let's clarify that for anybody tweeting this event. <laughs> at New York Times is who you should tweet that at, though, if you are going to tweet it. It helps the writing, right? <laughs> Actually, I got to amend that. I've been on that for 30 years. Uh, and you build a body of work, and people call, and with things. I mean, everybody's up here has gotten a weird call that you think, wow, it, if this is true, this is great. Mm -hmm. And it was true. And I did what Mark and Sasha and Marissa and everybody's done up here. I talked to those people for three weeks. I told them it was coming. I told them what I had. I had the documents. Uh, like I knew I had it pretty good when Bob Baffert, who will talk to a ham sandwich, wouldn't return my messages. <laughs> and, you know, that's just the way you do things. And it was one of those things, I mean, I wish I could say I'm a great sleuth and I'm all that, but somebody called me with the docs is what it comes down to, because they had read me for a long time. And that's where beat reporting comes down to. Yeah. What is your name, by the way? We can't see so good. Um, 
My name is Michael Pointer, and I uh, worked Michael at the Indianapolis Star. Star. Marissa yes, worked on Newside, and I was on sports. Oh, are you a plant in the audience? Is that what no. happened? Marissa no. brought a plant? No, we have, we have not kept in touch. I, no, uh, Michael, I've seen for you. Throw me a softball. I can't uh, quite, quite, quite frankly, true story, I was asked to leave the building in 2015, and I missed the business, but I now work in the labor union world, so uh, that's my challenge now. Great so, question. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Thank you, sir. Next question. So first of all, I just want to say thank you. This has been very interesting and informative for me. Uh, last year, I thought James Harden had an unprecedented season and potentially got snubbed and should have won the MVP. He made a very interesting comment when he was interviewed about it, saying that he thought that the media kind of rewrote the narrative, saying that they wanted Giannis to win all along. And because of all the media attention directed toward Giannis, they pushed him and therefore skewed the data and skewed just the entire season to make it so that no matter what happened, as long as Giannis didn't drop the ball, he was going to win. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you think the media does that in other sports and with other athletes, other competitions, and how does that play a role in the outcomes of the sports? Well, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but that's complete bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's bullshit. It's complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> Um, I had an MVP, MVP vote for a long time. I don't give a damn who I vote for. You have to make a call. You have to make a choice. It's, a, it's, a, it's an award. You have to pick somebody. I don't, well, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want James Harden to get this award, so let me come up with some numbers for Giannis to win the award. That's nonsense. You make a call. Were people biased for James Harden the year before when he got the MVP award? That's nonsense. You vote for who you vote for. I voted three years ago for Russell Westbrook because he broke a record that hadn't been broken in 52 years. And all the Houston Rockets fans thought I hated James Harden, which is also complete bullshit. You make a choice, you make a call. You don't have to agree with my call, but I get the vote because I have a certain expertise in this field and I get to make a decision based on my expertise. So that, I think that's utter nonsense. I'm sorry. I think that's nonsense. There, the Pete Alonso got uh, Rookie of the Year yesterday. Mm. One guy didn't vote for him. He happens to work for the Athletic, and he wrote a very, very, very compelling column about why he voted for Mike Soroka instead of Pete Alonso. Does that mean there was some conspiracy to keep Pete Alonso from getting a unanimous MVP vote? No. Come on, stop it. <laughs> Fans get too, you, you get too absorbed into a team, a player, that you start to believe things that, about the media that simply aren't true. They just, they just aren't. Now, if somebody's working for wizards.com or somebody's working for a Wizards blog or a New York Knicks blog, or they may, be, they may have a different criteria than I do, but most people who cover whatever it is, they don't care, <laughs> okay? I don't care who wins the MVP. It does not affect me one way or the other. I just have to make, I, I get a vote, I have to make a decision. I don't have a vote anymore, but when I did, I just did the best job I could, and maybe some years I got it wrong. But that doesn't mean I had, I had a pre, uh, preordained conclusion in my head, and I wanted to make the facts fit that conclusion. Joe will be drinking with David Bentley <laughs> later this evening if you all want to stop by and talk about James Harden. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, this has been awesome. I'm in love with every single one of you guys with the work that you guys do. So this has been awesome. Uh, my name is Reese Levin. I'm a student at the journalism school. As someone who's always been interested in investigative journalism and watching stories on like uh, shows like Outside the Lines, E60, Real Sports, and then reading investigative pieces, with all that information that you guys gather and then try and put into a story or uh, a broadcast piece, how do you not try and get overwhelmed with the amount of information that you are consuming and trying to give to the public? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, yeah, it, it's, it's the volume of information. It's um, the story you're trying to tell. Um, you're trying to convey, like the story that Mark's brother Steve reported on the Syrian national football team, their soccer squad, back in May of 
2017, which still, I think, is the high water mark of uh, uh, setting the bar of spending eight months traveling three continents, six countries, uh, talking to people who are in peril of their life, going right on the Turkish, up to the Syrian border, couldn't get quite into Syria. They wanted to go, reporting on the story. Fashioning a story in such a way, uh, the best pieces are cut and recut and recut perhaps two, two dozen or more times. Mm -hmm. And I, I will tell you, I don't have that skill. Uh, editorially, I think I might, but as far as visually, the visual components, and that's just as important as the editorial when you're trying to take a long-form piece and hold an audience, entertain them, and inform them um, of deciding, my gosh, yeah, that was a 20-frame change, but it was worth it, minute changes. So uh, I think, we, I mean, you've, you've gone, Mark, down this road many times in, in, in having stories over the people doing changes and over the shoulder uh, making, you know, sometimes it's exasperating, but the number of changes that are made at the end of the day, the finished product has many fingerprints, creative and talented fingerprints on it, but it takes a long time and a long form piece to get there. Um, but you raise an important point. It, it, sometimes it's the volume, but it's also just the shaping of the clay. The little things matter. I think the reality is you do get overwhelmed and you're Absolutely. drowning in information. And then if you're on a team, like when I was on the Globe Spotlight team, you hope you, ha you hope you have smart colleagues who can help you work through it, or you hope you have a great editor or editors who to help you do it, and that's part of the process too. Mm -hmm. And Marissa, you work with other writers. I mean, a lot, a lot of your stuff was co byline What was that like, and how did you decide uh, what went in and what went out? And were there debates? Were there arguments? Were there, no. did you all see everything? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. never. <laughs> no, never. I, I think like Sasha said, right, you're surrounded by really smart people. We had an amazing editor, Steve Berta, who was the main editor on the project. Um, we had a visuals journalist as well. And so we're constantly bouncing things off of each other and talking about things. Also, uh, you know, with our first article that came out, we had 13 editors on it. So when you talk about editing. <laughs> 13? Oh, yeah. Because it, it not only. How so many the lawyers? <laughs> yeah. Two? Maybe two? Uh, I mean, so that story was a little bit different because it was not only running in the Indianapolis Star, but across the USA Today network, so more than 100 properties were publishing it. So it got a higher level of scrutiny maybe than some of our other work might. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about the editing process. And so you start in one place and you end in another place and, you know, you make sure, first of all, it's clear for readers and you're also, you know, we talked about this, I think, earlier, but you're constantly checking yourself and checking your work and checking your colleagues' work. Like, could I be wrong? Is there some place that I'm not looking that may have information that might paint a different picture of what's going on here? And we were constantly, with every investigation that we do, we're constantly checking ourselves to make sure we're right. Yeah, and in case you didn't catch that, every investigation that these folks do is gonna go through lawyers who are gonna check, at question sure. every single fact and make sure everything they have done is, uh, is accurate, in addition to the regular editing process. And they are amazing, by the way. I just want to say our editors at Gannett are absolutely amazing, and they were uh, wonderful to work with. And this is important. That's a great question, because increasingly it's collaborative. Mm -hmm. There are people who can do things I can't do, who can, you know, take a month of reporting and put it in two images, 2008 football team, when there's 40 guys to 2018 when there's 16, and they can make it run across the screen on that. On the reporting end of it, John McPhee, who's a guy that probably you guys don't know as much about, but who I read coming up, said, and he was famous for just deep diving into everything from rowing to geography, geology, and he said, when you come out of the reporting experience, your knowledge should be like the edge of a diamond. You ought to be able to etch out this story very clearly, and it's more important what you leave out than what you put in. And, you know, that's great pulling me through when I'm working on something. My mantra is inch by inch, life's a cinch. Yard by yard, life is hard. So I always like break it down to what I'm trying to do. But once you get to there, then you go, you give it over to editors and lawyers and everything else, and they tell you things 
that you haven't thought about, or they say, okay, cut all this stuff out, and you know, let's focus on that. So it, it's really important that editors are not out to get you. They're there <laughs> to make you better. And it, it, you know, when I was young, I didn't want to hear that either. All right, so let's uh, roll through some you. of these questions. Just, In the back. Say, let me just say one thing really quickly. Okay. Because I just want to emphasize, I, I think, I don't want to lose what Sasha said, because you will be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely overwhelming to the point of being paralyzing at times. Mm -hmm. The trying to distill the amount of information that gets gathered over a year, a year or whatever, and I think allowing yourself to be overwhelmed is like part of the challenge. So I, I just think it's, like, I don't, I don't think anybody should forget that. Like, it, it, is, it is overwhelming, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, easy to figure it out. In the back. Uh, first, I just want to say this panel has been so interesting, and I've learned a lot from it from uh, just this one hour, so thank you so much. Um, I'm a senior at Paint Branch High School. I also work for well, work. I write for my, um, my school paper, PB Mainstream, and I'm in favor of this movement, but I just want to talk about, like, the... Um, the movement of taking a knee during the national anthem mm -hmm. um, with the NFL and how uh, controversial did it get and what's your opinions on it? Uh, well, um, I think, uh, I don't think you give up your right to express yourself because you put on a pad and helmets. Right. I don't think that would apply to anybody anywhere. Um, so I think whether it's Colin Kaepernick or the, there are a lot of pro-military people in sports as well, and they're allowed to express their opinions and their views as well. Um, someone mentioned this, that you know, Colin Kaepernick never called a press conference and said, from now on I'm going to kneel before games during the anthem to protest police brutality. He only, <laughs> and he only told you what he was doing because Steve Weiss asked him, why are you doing that? That's, why, that's how it came out. And he said, I'm doing it to, poli to protest police brutality. And so, he, of course he has the right to do that. Um, sure, of course he does. Um, now, I'll say this, actions have consequences as well. And I don't like that he's been blackballed, but it's not a government agency. It's a, it's a private sports league. They can set the rules under which you're employed there. It's unfortunate, but it's true. So um, they don't have to employ him. They can make that choice. I think they're wrong to make that choice, but they are allowed to make that choice. Okay, question in the front. Uh, so I've, first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here. It's been an amazing panel. I've really learned a lot. Uh, my name is Adam, I'm a sophomore in high school. And earlier, a couple of you mentioned how a lot of big articles come off of writing a beat. And really, my main question is, if you do write a big article kind of exposing a player while you're still on a beat about the team, how do you not completely fracture a relationship with that team where they don't want to talk to you at all anymore because you just exposed like one of their top players? I love what Joe said earlier. You show up the next day and you let them chew you out. I mean, we had people when we were writing about USA Gymnastics, we were writing about them for a long time. And I had a former official chew me out on the phone and say, I don't trust anything you guys do. And I said, okay, well, I'm writing this thing and I think your perspective is really important. And you told me this thing when you were yelling at me and I think it's important for the public to understand what you just said. Can I report that? Mm -hmm. And eventually by the end of the conversation, he said, okay, yes, you can. And then he sent me an email later and he was like, hey, I was wrong about you, thanks for quoting me accurately, and I appreciate you letting me share my perspective. And it was because I didn't just, you know, I wasn't argumentative, I wasn't pushing back, I just took it. I would say, I mean, I, I don't disagree at all with Marissa, but I, I think it is a, especially at the pro, I mean, I think it's probably true at the high school level too, but at any level, it is a complicated issue. And I, and I don't think it's, it's always gonna work that way. I think oftentimes it's gonna work the opposite way in which the relationship is fractured. And, and it's why I think in many cases, I mean, when we were doing the steroid stories, our, our beat guy who was unbelievable and was forced to go confront Barry Bonds every time we had a story basically, yeah. because we were, couldn't walk into the locker room and give up that we had a story. 
So he oftentimes, I would call his, Barry's lawyer and our beat guy would suffer having to go talk to Barry. And um, there's no way he could have covered that story. But not only, I mean, he couldn't have covered it from a time standpoint. You know, a beat is a time consuming thing. So the idea that you could take the time on that beat and actually investigate is difficult. So I, I don't, I, I think it's a really challenging thing. And I, and I think it's a case by case deal where sometimes it's gonna work and a lot of times it's not and you're gonna have to toss that story to somebody else and help. But I think the best beat people help. Thank you. In the back. Once again, I want to thank you guys for coming out. This has been very informative. And my question is, do you believe the NBA is handling the Hong Kong situation right? And if so, how long will it take the league to recover from this? Mr. NBA? <laughs> is that you, Joe? Is that no. You? <laughs> no I, I, I just think it's geopolitics. No, they're not handling it right, but neither is Coca-Cola and, and Google and everybody else. And I Facebook. Mean, yeah, I mean, it's, they, again, that goes into our entree into sports. People can relate to the NBA getting banned there. I mean, the rest of the population doesn't care if they can't Google over there. I mean, that's it, not a compelling, it's a compelling story, but it doesn't reach the mass that sports reaches. So that's my, you And, go and the me. people who don't care that they can't Google are going to Disney Shanghai. Yeah. Correct, yeah. The park. I wrote a column about this when it happened, soon after it happened, I should say, and I said, if you, if you use one of these to send your tweet in about how the NBA is kowtowing to China, then you're just as complicit as they are because Apple took the app off of their phone that allowed the people in Hong Kong to see where the police were so that they could protest. Apple did that. Hollywood doesn't, Hollywood has completely capitulated to China. Yeah, I've read they edit movies. Yeah. And take stuff out. So every if you've ever flown an airline, an airplane, anywhere, you're complicit in this because every airline in the world now does not recognize Taiwan as a separate country from China. Because China put pressure on every airline in the world to do that. So my point is not that we're my point was that yes, the NBA handled this not well. All of us are handling this not well because it's very difficult to do anything on a global basis that doesn't include two billion people on Earth. <laughs> you know, you have to do business with that country if you're going to do business around the world. Um, so it's not as cut and dried as the NBA should stand up for the people in Hong Kong. Well, so should you. <laughs> you know, so should you. Um, and we all make compromises between our ideals and our practices. And that's part of, I think, what I would say about it. Have, well, also agreeing with you that the NBA handled this really badly. We have time for a couple more, yes? Hi, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Daryl, I'm a freshman journalism student here, and I've noticed a lot recently with me just talking to my friends and also just being aware of the world around us, a lot of people are starting to lose faith in journalism and, I guess, news. Mm -hmm. And people are just kind of pushing, I guess, even the truth tellers to the side. And like coming up as a young journalist and trying to be the ones that tell the truth and don't twist things and be honest, how can we restore the public's faith in journalism? <laughs> Sorry, no, question. <laughs> no, these are how really far are we questions. from the White House? <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, that one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the gigantic question for the industry right now. And, and there's a lot of outside forces working against our ability to keep doing our jobs well. And as I said earlier, I think it puts an enormous burden on the news consumer to also try to determine if what they're consuming is reliable. So it's, that's a, that's a, it's not an easy answer. You've got Saturday, I was in Southwest Ohio, getting ready to go to a high school game for this story, and I stopped at Patrick's Pub in Anno, Ohio. I wanted to see LSU Alabama. I wanted to keep my eye on that. Mm -hmm. And so I go and I order a beer, and it's a full bar, and they were very nice and welcoming, and we're all watching the game, and then the conversation breaks out, you know. Fake news, man. They only tell us what they want to tell us. And they just started going on an incredible rant. And I was definitely the minority there. And I was actually texting my wife and a few other people. I was like, 
this is kind of funny, but I'm a red stater. I kind of get it. And we just got to keep doing the work and let it land where it lands. But you're right. It's hostile right now. It's no. really hostile. Yeah, it's tough. It's always been hard, though. Journalists have been under fire for hundreds of years. This, this, this yes, isn't sure. anything new. It, mm -hmm. It's a part of the profession. It's not for the lighthearted. Uh, I think what drives us is that pursuit of truth. So, so how do you restore faith? When you do an investigative piece that shows that the Catholic Church was allowing the molestation of young children, and then it turns out that that story was correctly right, was right 100%. When you do a story that accuses USA Gymnastics mm -hmm. of allowing of turning a blind eye to a doctor who's molesting uh, athletes, and it turns out to be right. That's how you build your, your credibility. You can do nothing about the person af that, after you've reported the truth, still wants to call you fake news. You just got to put that person aside. But if you really want to get into this profession, it, it, it takes a tough skin yeah. uh, and the passionate belief in what you're doing, and that what you're doing is right, and that what you're doing is important, and that that's why it's in the Constitution. And that's why we do what we do. Uh, journalism is not, well, for most of the people up here, is not a high-paying, glamorous position. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do it for that. We do it for the, for the passion and the work. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and with that, we're going to bring the evening to an end. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, remember, please remember, that on April 1st, we're having the George Solomon, Georgia Palooza, uh, Georgia -palooza as it's called. <laughs> We are looking for donations. Anyone who donates more than $4, Joe Drape will come to your family's Thanksgiving dinner and just tell stories all night. Uh, in fact, till $3, you give $3 and Joe will come and just tell stories. Uh, and it'll be far better than listening to crazy Uncle Lester. Where, where, where's Lucy? Because I'll, I'll take that chair for a lot less. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very thank much. You I want to thank the thank panel for coming, coming in. And thank you for being such a great audience.